Hello and welcome again to The Goddess in Art. Our program is dedicated to the oldest and most enduring tradition in art, The Goddess in Art. My name is Star Goody and my guest for the next two shows is Vicki Noble. Vicki Noble is a feminist shaman healer. She is the co-creator of the Mother Peace Tarot deck and the author of Mother Peace, A Way to the Goddess Through Myth, Art and Tarot and the co-author of the Mother Peace Tarot playbook. She is now working on a book, Shakti Woman, as well as Snake Power, a journal of female shamanism. And she recently founded a school for women for the shamanic healing arts in Berkeley. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you. Well, first things first, Vicki. Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Same to you. This, this show is being taped on Halloween, and I think it's very appropriate in terms of what we're going to be talking about, that, that this very sacred holiday, which is really like the beginning of the year in the old way, in the old earth-based religions, that this is the start of the year and a very, very good day to talk about this. Because the first thing I really wanted to ask you is, in reading your work and listening to you t your lectures and taking a workshop with you, it's very clear that the central focus of your work is on the dark goddess. Mm -hmm. And it's an energy you call the dark goddess. And I wanted you to share with us what the dark goddess is to you and why you put her as the foundation of your work. Well, the dark goddess is the goddess of um, transformation, of healing and regeneration and death and rebirth. A perfect Halloween uh, symbolism. Yeah. <laughs> and I make her the basis of my work because she's really the basis of all shamanic work all over the world, all through time. All shamans are participating in the transformation mystery and all the shamanic healing, whether it's tribal culture, or whether it's ancient culture, or whether it's um, happening in the United States today, is participating in her realm. So the Dark Goddess is with us today, and she's been with us from the beginning because she's an eternal quality, so she's always yeah. there with us. And uh, it isn't just something that uh, emerged in the 60s or something. I mean, it's really as far back as we can look through the artifact. I mean, there's like really concrete archaeological evidence of, of her presence, and that's why I like to bring that up, too, because the show really is about art, mm -hmm. and, and the artifacts are art, mm -hmm. and, and we see her presence in that. Well, she has a very dynamic presence in the ancient cultures, in um, the cultures that Rianne Eisler defines as partnership cultures, or what feminists have called matriarchal times. She lives in those times in, in the art and in the artifacts. There's actually um, a disappearance of her icons for 5,000 years, more or less and she goes underground. And the way that she's come through the last 5,000 years has been a little bit more morbid and repressed and a little more demonic. She's actually been equated with the demonic because of her repression and because of her suppression. But before that, you see her vividly in ancient um, cultures from all over the world. In other words, uh, try as the last 5,000 patriarch years may. I mean, there's no way one can do without her. I mean, you if she wasn't her go away, <laughs> <laughs> no matter what, she's there one way or another. Yes, so yes. it's whether you want to uh, try and have some kind of contact or relationship with her or whether you want to let it just explode. In some right, way. exactly. Whether you want to ignore and try to control and repress her or whether you want to allow her to have her way. She represents a very deep force of transformation and change. And the last 5,000 years have been a time of trying to pretend that there is no such thing, that, there, that things are linear, that they go along and, and don't have a cyclic reality. Vicki, isn't she going to have her way anyway? <laughs> she is going to have her way one way or the other. Um, <laughs> one of the other things about your work, one of the many facets of your work in this shamanic healing, and that's very interesting to me what you're reclaiming there, is, um, and it seems the core of that is the blood mysteries, you know, I mean, we know, like, there's such a menstrual taboo in this, this culture, you know, in the PMS, and take a bunch of pills and pretend you're a man or something, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. Um, Business as usual. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but in your work and in, in your scholarship and in your own and you're an artist, too. I mean, you drew the Mother Peace Tarot text, you know, so you, you really are in tune with 
the, the scholarship and the creativity. And in your work, you have been um, looking at these blood mysteries and at the source of power, and in fact, saying that really evolution began around the um, groups of, of women and children, and of course the children would be male and female, the boys and girls, that that, that was like the central mm -hmm. core, and around that are the blood mysteries of the women, and, and that this really is like the first um, sacred mysteries. These are the first uh, shamanic, the beginnings of the shamanic tradition. I just wondered if you'd talk a bit about that. Right. Well, I even equate the dark goddess with the menstrual time mm -hmm. and really look at the whole um, feminine archetype through the polar opposites of the female cycle. So there's the ovulation period and there's the bleeding time. And the ovulation period represents, is represented by all the light goddesses or the nurturing mother goddesses. And the dark goddess represents the menstrual pole, and she's what's been repressed for 5,000 years. So I think in the ancient times, it's pretty clear that women as a community bled together, mm -hmm. and that that alone was very powerful because it's a very psychically open time. And so if you can imagine all of us in a village or a tribe bleeding together, being open at the same time psychically to new information, to the future, to past lives, to all the kinds of um, beliefs that uh, were held by the ancient people, that we could open to um, phenomena from the spirit world at those times, which is shamanic work, that we would be um, really natural vessels for shamanic healing power and for shamanic information to come through for the community. In other words, it's just really a basic tuning because um, that is the time of the bleeding. There is a particular power if one really got in touch yes, with that. It's and it's just there. Yes, it's biological. Yes. And that's really a source of creativity is tuning the personal and the impersonal. Exactly. In the early days of the feminist movement, there was a kind of recoiling from the biological. Exactly. Dialogi biological was considered to destine us to be secondary, and so feminists ran away from it and said that we didn't have any differences from men and that our bleeding meant nothing and don't worry about it. But I think now that in women's spirituality, there's a deep reclaiming where we're seeing that the basis of our power, the core of the power, is through the biological mysteries and that birthing and bleeding and the incredible kundalini power that's available to women through those actions is um, available to us, even in modern times. And there's a resurgence of that kind of awakening energy in all women on the planet right now. Well, and, and in thinking of the menstrual blood, really, when you th you think of it anciently and 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 now, it is such a, a magic, potent subject. I mean, it is. Its coagulation is like the the, the um, foundation for life. It's the rich source mm -hmm, of life, mm -hmm. and uh, it's the sea that we carry within us. Exactly. You know that it's the source of life, and that to really be honoring that, and one can just try and imagine what. Um, how our ancestors related to that. Exactly. I think that a lot of the group ritual work and group power that we know the ancients possessed, even the power to move stones through sound and through group energy, I think that kind of power w is available to us when we bleed and when we give birth, and that we simply don't know about utilizing it. Well, I'd like to take a look at some of the um, images you brought, uh, mm -hmm. the slides of, of artifacts, because I know that uh, Snakes is really connected with that, and I think we can start to tie that in, too. So let's take a look at the first images you brought in, the, and some of them are very, very old. And mm -hmm. Okay, here we, here we have the rainbow serpent. This is an Australian Aborigine rock art painting, um, and the Australian Aborigines believe, as many cultures do, that the, the creatrix of the world is a great snake who also is the world. She lives at the center of the world, and she creates the earth through her undulating movement. This is why I call my work Snake Power. Now, how old is this? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. It's very old. And the rock art that the Australian Aborigines make goes back um, for millennia. So this particular painting may not be that old, but the um, oral tradition is uh, ageless. OK, now here we have a fascinating, uh, these two figures. What are they doing, Vicky? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, is, this blows the myth that our ancient ancestors didn't know about reproduction, didn't know about the male role in reproduction. This is also an Australian rock art painting um, or inscription, and it's um, two people making love, and it's connected with the puberty rites and the fertility mysteries. And it, it makes it very clear there's, a, there's an image just like this in the Paleolithic times in Europe, in the cave at La Salle, and there's another image uh, like this in the tantric tradition in India much, much later. So we have a little bit of a thread from 30,000 years ago through um, the Australian art until now. Now this, I think, is so exquisitely beautiful. To me, this is really a lovely artifact. I mean, just the simplicity of it. And, and 
Why don't you tell us what this is? Well, this is a, what they call a ceremonial wand. Um, they actually spent time trying to decipher this and thinking that it might be a wrench or a spear thrower or a <laughs> weapon of some kind. But now they know that it's actually one of the many early calendars, menstrual calendars, lunar calendars that midwives and women kept. Um, relating their cycles in the body to the cycles of the moon to the cycles of the cosmos. This is a similar image, um, a calendar that's notched with uh, time factored notching over a period of months and breasts. I, I don't know whether it's in relation to the nursing cycle. I think that it might be. So again, it's this, it's this rhythm of the blood, of the moon, yes, of the cycles everything. of things. And right. of course, with the dark goddess, looking at her in a cyclical way takes away the terror because there's yes, this reemergence. Yes. Where there's death, there's rebirth. That's the meaning of the snake. Here's a, an Indian image, a contemporary Indian image of the snake woman, the serpent woman. In India, women are considered to be half snake, and in many cultures around the world, that is our strongest totem, that women and the earth, women and the dark goddess are equated. We are equal. This is so fascinating because she's terrifyingly beautiful, I think. <laughs> <laughs> she has power, doesn't yes, she? Yes, she really the does. The dark goddess brings us a kind of raw power, an instinctual power. And here she is in her Indian form as Kali. This is one of my favorite images of the dark goddess. She has her third eye open. She sees things as they are. She brings about a liberating consciousness, a clarity that's mm -hmm. really almost intolerable. And she frees us from form and structure and from old patterns. So when she comes to, into our lives, we change, like it or not. This is such an exquisite piece, too. This is wonderful. I call her the Shakti woman. She's going to be the frontispiece in my book. Oh, wonderful. And now, to me, this says it all. I mean, that <laughs> snake emerging from the vulva, I mean, the iconography yeah. of this, it says it all. And I think so, too. This is the serpent power manifesting in a positive way, outwardly in the world, in a, in a dynamism that women who come into their own power experience as teachers and healers. Um, in looking at this last piece, I think it'd be interesting if you could connect the snake, the vulva, the blood, you know, how these things all tie in together. They're all connected with the power that comes through the biological cycle that we've been talking about. The snake is connected everywhere with women in the early times. It's very late that it's, con that it's seen as phallic or connected in some way with male energy. Even the Shakti woman with the serpent manifesting from her vulva is often called phallic. But I don't think that's what's intended or that that's the kind of conceptual framework that the Indian people see her in. She's really a representation of a very active power coming out of a woman. And the blood represents the time of the month when a woman can tap that power the most readily. And that's why they call us bitchy and make epithets that have to do with being on the rag and things like that. Right, well, men might not have menstrual cycles, but have they done such a great job running the world? I mean, <laughs> we're on the brink of destruction 20 different ways, you know. It's yeah, like this, the blood cycle is a source of um, real deep female authority, which is exactly. what's missing from our world. And the first blood at the altar, this is documented now, the first blood at the altar was menstrual blood. Women giving their blood at the altar in a regular, natural, routine way, um, and using that sacred power magically in the community for governing that old authority was lost with the menstrual taboo, with the changeover. And when the blood that women gave freely without death um, was taken away and women weren't priestesses any longer and men became priests, they had to get blood from somewhere. And it's the beginning of sacrifice. So there's an ethics to this that's very clear cut. And I think when we take back our blood cycle in a sacred way that each individual woman contributes to peace on earth because I think that if we were all bleeding together and really acknowledging and honoring that, there wouldn't be bloodshed all over the earth um, because there's some way the blood needs earth magically. It's a mystery. But, but also even um, biologically, isn't menstrual blood, it is a very fertile thing. It's I mean, you extremely fertile. It's the best fertilizer on the planet. The plants love it. Feed your house plants. See how they do. They thrive. And I think that the connection with women running naked through the fields and bleeding in the corn furrows and things like that, and also sexuality connected with that. In the Celtic lore, we hear that the people coupled in the corn furrows during the bleeding time, and that, and that that was fertility for the fields. And I think it's both physical and also it's um, etheric 
powerful on the energy level. And it seems so much of that, that menstrual taboo is that terror of female authority, that exactly. what's behind it. Exactly. I agree. It, it's one of the things I teach my students, one of the core principles I um, provide for them is the sense of centering in the belly where the snake lives mm. and making a connection to the earth where the big snake lives and beginning to contact your own standpoint, the place where you know what's true in the moment and being able to anchor there and to stay in that space it, even when confronted, even when there's conflict. And part of what we know is true is that women give birth and that that is, and you call that like the really quintessential shamanic act. Exactly. And um, I would like you to talk a little bit about that. Well, it's the bird and snake goddess that Maria Gimbutas has provided us with such ample evidence of. It's the, it's the solid planting of the feet on the earth and doing something that is so physical that you're literally grunting and bleeding. And at the same time, so that's animal. Yes. That's the snake. And at the same time, a woman giving birth, if she's not interfered with, not drugged and not interfered with in a medical way, her crown chakra opens and she has a shamanic experience or an experience of an altered state of consciousness and that's the bird. Because she, she is on the edge of death. She is She's absolutely on the edge and the kundalini power is available and she stares right into the doorway between life and death and she brings a soul from the side of the invisible right. into the world, you know, into concrete manifestation. That's a very strong shamanic act. Out of nothing something comes. Uh -huh. Out of nothing something grows inside of her. Yes. Out of nothing the goddess created the universe. You know, there's an obvious parallel between birthing and birthing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at some of the birthing images, the art that was created by uh -huh. different cultures all around the world around this. So I'd like to see some of these birthing images to, so we, that r the artists really capture. Now look at this. I mean, it really... This is another one from a temple in India, very like the Shakti woman, only here she is in the act of giving birth. Instead of a snake coming out of her vulva, there's a child emerging. And you see her holding a rope, pulling a rope, as they do in many cultures, to um, bear through the labor pains. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she's in a squatting position, which is standard in most cultures other than our own. But the expression on her face, it's so transcendental. Yes, yes you know? she's I mean, serene. She's, she's in a sacred experience. Her consciousness is altered. She doesn't need drugs. And here's an Aztec birthing goddess. This is actually a tiny little statue, about eight inches high, made out of serpentine. And she's um, showing us the real um, gritting and bearing down of the birthing activity. You know, when a woman goes through this kind of an experience and she's not interfered with and she's not stopped and helped in her yes. process in any way, she learns a kind of empowerment that's available through the cells only. If we were allowed to give birth in these ways, um, even American women would have a kind of empowerment that we see in tribal women. They would know that they could do this yes, incredible feat. Yes, it's incredible we think we can't. Yes. This is a very early uh, Mexican image, an Olmec goddess, a uh, mother goddess, but also a death goddess. You see in her face that she's in trance or that she, she sees into the other world. And she has a birthing rope around her waist, which is traditional and relates as well to the zodiac, relates oh. to the sky goddess and her belt, oh. Ishtar's belt, Ishtar's girdle. This is the Mexican version of that, relating the cosmos to our bodies. This is the Aztec calendar stone. I use this image because it uh, shows the earth goddess at the center in her Kali-like form with her tongue out and the cycle of the seasons rotating around her. And it's a very intense calendar. It has actually the orbits of Mars and Venus and the moon and the sun and you know, shows the entire solar system and how its interlocking movements are working are the workings of the goddess. It's, it's interesting that they put that uh, image in the center, that devouring image, because uh -huh, you know, uh -huh, it's really acknowledging goddess, it. Yes. Time, cycles, death and rebirth. Here's a priestess from ancient Mexico with an obsidian mirror on her chest. They call uh, figures like this dancing girls and pretty ladies. Well, she's a Venus. She's got a mirror, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And look at her face. She, too, is in a sacred state, in a state of looking into the other world. Very much shamanic power in her in her posture, in her face. And the power in her limbs, the power of yes, her buttocks. Yes. This is one of my favorite pieces of art. I think it is so exquisite. I like her too. This is a shaman from Mexico. Um, you can barely see the little holes at the top of her head. She's a big clay piece and they think that they used to put feathers in her head and decorate her in that way, in the traditional shamanic way. I also like just the, the exquisiteness. There's something about her face that she's so alive. Yes, You know, she that is. she really is peering really into you. Really present. 
definitely. <laughs> in a frightening way. The artist who, who created that was really very gifted. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so here we see this acknowledgement of the dark goddess and, and, and in the very process of giving life. So it, again, it's that paradox of yes. like seeing that darkness it, but seeing it in life. Which is say, in life is death and death is life. There's a, there's a kind of a swinging doorway between the two, but the goddess holds the whole thing. She's a symbol of the container of life and death, of male and female. She loves all of it and holds us through all of it. I think it's so interesting that the thing that is so, the most terrifying culturally is this female authority, this female dark, this dark goddess, the Dakini, that this is the very thing that can lead us to some sort of liberation, that can lead us to exactly. some wholeness. It's probably the only thing at this point that can lead us to some wholeness. We're so far gone on the planet in the sense of the pollution and the um, cutting down all the trees and all of that sort of thing. The only thing I think at this point is a shamanic awakening, a, a thrust from within, a thrust from within the earth that then comes through us in some way as well. And I think that's what the resurgence of the Dark Goddess is about. I think it's an opportunity for us to align with a natural, organic process which is going to carry us into the creation of a new world that uh, suits us and that suits life, that relates to life and is not anti-life and not anti-feminine. And I think one of the empowering things of looking at it in art is because art is always like through the imagination, it's through more than what we know. Yes. So, and that's why it's so alive and that's why it's healing because it's, I mean, there is something so fascinating about these images and looking at them that there's something that they can give us that's more than what we really know because oh, they're, yes. they're symbols and there's, they're a totality of something. Yes, they evoke and they remind us and they actually awaken us to memories that we hold in our bodies and that otherwise have been erased from our history books and so on. So no matter how the archaeologists and the anthropologists interpret the ancient images, if you look directly at them, you get a different message. You they get can't a message take that from us. Yeah. That's right. I want to go right to these images of the dark goddess. Um, there's a, we have a series of images of them, and I'd like to look at those because I think they really speak for mm -hmm. themselves. And, and also, when we, so let's see these images now. When we have an image like this, it gives us a, it gives us a myth. Yes, and I think the myth whole is story. so important. Uh -huh. Well, isn't she sort of attractive, even though she's frightening? I, that's how I feel about her. This is an Australian ogress. And I don't know, she's blowing, or she's calling, or she's chanting, or she's singing, but she's definitely representing the other world, the invisible spirit world, what we can't see. The goddess as the unseen real is the way one modern author put it. Because we know she's real. We right. experience we her. her. We know it. Right. We know it. And in naming her, and th now this is a really interesting Cretan piece too, because she also has like mushrooms or poppies. Poppies. And th that's a whole her, other story too, piece. the psychedelics. Yeah. But, <laughs> right. but there we have it. Clearly, she's in a state of trance and a, a journeying um, consciousness, uh, peering into, seeing into, relating to the other side, to the invisible world, getting her information and, and her contact with that. She has her arms in the traditional posture of a priestess upraised, almost like antennae. Uh -huh. And then we have the bird goddess, the crown of birds. Uh -huh. So again, it's uh -huh. the crown, the birds. This is a powerful piece. This is another Cretan image. This was a life-size statue of a woman who's clearly either the goddess or her sacred representative. She's um, got her face painted with white gypsum. Robert Graves says the priestesses always painted their faces with white gypsum to do their rituals. She's also got either tattooing or face painting marks. It's so a channel of the impersonal, but Absolutely. it's more than just your yeah, human... She's not there as a person. As yes. a, she's not there as a personality. She's really bringing something larger through. Here's the larger she's bringing through. This is Coatlicue from the Aztec um, times. She's a, a Mexican version of Kali and has uh, snakes and birds and jaguars and owls and has all the motifs of the dark goddess. And too. universally, here we have Crete, here we have Mexico. Exactly, and very strong connections between the old world and the new, as and they the call snake, them. And the snake, the snake, always the snake. Everywhere, and here's a Peruvian Medusa image. I don't know what they called her in Peru, but this is from the ancient times. It's made out of gold, and they actually, the archaeologists still are calling this the sun god. Hmm. Clearly, this is the feminine, the dark feminine, with her snake wisdom emerging out of her head, as in so many other cultures around the world. I'd like to address this point, what I brought up is the idea of the myth giving us like a back, 
ground. I mean, here we are in this like terminal state in the planet, and we really don't have anything to assist us in this transformation. And that's why looking at these images, again, we know that this force is there, yes. and now we're naming it and acknowledging yes. it. Sometimes just looking at your terror, it's not that it's solved, but it's named, and you yes. know that it's there, and that, and just knowing that somehow that is a relief or assists mm -hmm. us. So I, if you could tie in like the myth and the mm -hmm. healing of looking at these images and giving us this tradition. Yes, I think it's our, it's our hope at this point. This is what Rianne Eisler's work is about in The Chalice and the Blade. She says that it's a time of chaos or disequilibrium, as happens occasionally in our social development, and that during times of instability like this, something new can emerge from, from the periphery to the center, and that it, what it takes is a... Um, uh, critical mass and the images that we're creating and experiencing and reclaiming are, are what's needed. We need a critical mass of those images, I think, and we can go over the hump and into a new culture that is sort of like an old culture, but something that we create in the moment from who we actually are and from where we've come and leading into the future with a lot of consciousness and hope. And to know, I mean, I always say that this is the oldest tradition of art, and it is, because the Absolutely. goddess was the first subject of art, and that in reclaiming that iconography, we have a myth, we have a tradition, we say, oh, I'm not the only one, or, exactly. you know, and we see, and like the set painting that we're using here is by contemporary artist Charles Sherman, which is the power of creation, the power of the vulva, and it's all done in birds. Uh -huh. So here we have uh -huh. a modern artist, like it re-emerging, and, and it's and dark. And artist. Yes, uh -huh. yes. And Bringing the dark goddess through. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, being around other women into the goddess and being inspired by them, uh -huh. but but in a new form, mm -hmm. and which is what mm -hmm. we need. And the and the um, Shilinagog image, the the vulva being held open, is such a frightening image in general in our culture that I think that for a man to be bringing that back is very powerful. To be looking into that, you know, fearlessly is a good example for other men. Okay, well, Vicky, I'd like to thank you for this first half of our interview and uh, again wish you a happy Halloween <laughs> thank you. and uh, thank you for being my guest this thank evening. You. It's a pleasure. Okay, and good night and thank you for watching. <laughs> Okay.